I'm going to talk uh, for as long as Amit will let me, because um, I have more material than there's time for. Uh, primarily about this idea of, of sketching that, that may be familiar to some of you. And, and you know, the organisers said, can I give a, a fairly introductory talk? So um, I'll give pointers sort of to the more advanced topics, but hopefully try and make it as understandable as possible. Okay, yeah. Um, so we're interested in, in working with data that is large in some sense and, and uh, over the last few years, we've had no shortage of motivations for why data is large and perhaps larger than the um, laptop or desktop that we would happen to, to want to analyze it with um, from a whole variety of, of different applications. So we've got large quantities of data. We don't just want to look at it, we actually want to understand it, so we need to get some information out of it. Um, and so we need smart algorithms, inference techniques, statistical approaches that will let us understand these patterns and trends in the data. And you know, there's a number of different ways you might want to do that. You might want to just sort of collect statistics on a continuing basis. You might want to allow arbitrary queries to be posed to the data after you've seen it. Uh, you might want to sort of keep track of what's happening and know when things have changed. Or you might want to do this sort of more exploratory analysis, what's often called data mining. Okay, so many different ways you might want to access the data. But in all these cases, there's certain sort of basic questions that we need to be able to answer. We need to be able to say, you know, at the most basic level, if I've seen some data, how is it distributed? How is it, you know, what frequency distribution does it obey? How many different entities did we see? How many entities satisfying some predicate did we see? Can we draw a sample from the data? All of these are sort of fairly fundamental, basic questions that we know pretty well how to answer if we have all the data right in front of us, but if we're dealing with a very large quantity of data, possibly coming at us very quickly, possibly spread out over a number <coughs> of locations, then we need to revisit these, these sort of basic questions, and that's what we'll be doing over the course of these two sessions this morning. So a lot of this work arose out of this model of streaming data, so I'll, I'll introduce that streaming model. Um, so yesterday, you know, I think if you were here for Christian Zola's talk, you saw him talk about a sort of essentially a sampling-based model, one where you can probe the data at random. This is one, a different model that says you see all the data, but there's just so much of it that you can't remember it all. Right? So we're going to think of cases where actually each individual observation is very simple, a simple tuple. But because there are so many of them and they're describing a complex whole, we get some grand challenge. So I'll think of a couple of different models. Um, most of the results I'll talk today work in the stronger model. So the weaker model is what's called the cash register model. That says, you know, we're seeing a stream of data. So here's a tiny stream, just three tuples that say three observations of an item whose I'll give the name A, two observations of the item I'll give the name B, two further observations of A. So you, know, you can kind of think of that as saying, you know, here's my three A's, my two B's, and my further two A's, giving me a grand total of five A's and two B's. Right? So this is the kind of thing we're dealing with, but you just have to imagine that you know, this stream is immensely long and this universe of possible elements that we might see is extremely huge. All right, so this captures various things you might see if you're analyzing data on a network. If you're looking at you know, information coming from smart grid or other places where we're just capturing large quantities of data. So in this model, cache register, we only see sort of arrivals. We only see um, new values adding to what we've seen already. And natural generalizations say, well, what if I also allow negative updates? So that gets the name turnstile, this idea of elements coming in and going out. So now I could see a very similar stream of, of again, three tuples, three arrivals of A, two arrivals of B, but then two departures of A. So, you know, my three A's arrive, my two B's arrive, and then the first two depart, leaving me with an aggregate distribution of one A and two B's. Right. And again, very, some, some natural situations where you would see these arrivals and departures, other places where you may not explicitly see departures, but you may be looking at, let's say, two observations at different 
time periods, and you want to study the difference. So you have a sort of a natural subtraction operation on these distributions. Okay. But for the most part today, just think about that we're dealing with this, this data and we're seeing it in this incremental fashion. We want to know how can we build algorithms, data structures, tools that will allow us to understand properties um, of these distributions. So here's my agenda for the day. Um, and we'll see how much of it we feel like going through. Um, so most of the techniques I'm going to talk about fall into a class of algorithms called sketches, so I'll explain what I mean by those, and give an introduction to sketches um, based on frequency distributions, and along the way build some of the statistical tools, some of the tools of concentration of measure that will allow us to analyse them. We'll look at a few different examples of sketches, and then as time permits we'll look at some more advanced topics from the last few years. And as usual, I hope this is a sufficiently relaxed environment that if people have questions, they can just raise a hand at any point and I'll do my best to answer them. OK, so I talked about sketch as being a natural, as being something we want to use to m model this input. So when I say sketch, what I mean is something like a model as a linear transformation of the input. right? So for most of the examples I'll look at, I can think of this input as a stream essentially defining a vector, a very high dimensional vector with some frequency information. So indexed by the different items, frequency information. So I want to think about summaries that I can represent as a linear transformation of that input. Right? So in other words, there's some matrix S, and I can think of my input as a, as a vector X, so that my representation, my summary, is um, that linear transformation S multiplied by X. Right. So, you know, why do I want that? One, one, it makes the analysis much easier. Um, I get nice properties so that if I want to think of any scalar alpha times an input X plus another scalar beta times an input Y, then my sketch of the linear combination of these is just a linear combination of the sketches. And when I have a sketch like this, it's fairly straightforward just to update it with one new observation because I can keep my current sketch and just add on the contribution that my new observation makes um, you know, just directly additively. Or I can take observations from different locations and put them together. So the hesitation you should have if you've not seen this before is to say, well, hang on. So I just said that this vector x is so huge and high dimensional that I can't possibly imagine storing it. And now I'm saying that my data structure is going to be formed as a product of some matrix S and this vector X. Well, surely this, this matrix S has to be even bigger than X. So for the most part, we're going to be interested in cases where this transformation S is not represented explicitly as a matrix, but is represented implicitly um, in some very compact representation. So often we're going to talk in terms of hash functions, right? Functions drawn from a, a compact family of fact functions that appear random or to be sort of random enough for our analysis. So actually, although there is this linear interpretation, there's also going to be this more algorithmic hash function based interpretation. And if these hash functions are simple, if the, the structure is, um, if essentially if this matrix is not too dense, if it's got many zeros in, then it's going to be also quite fast to compute these kind of sketch-based transformations. So I talked about hash functions. What do I mean by those? Um, so I'm going to be looking at, at some functions H that map some from some input domain N to some other domain M. And I'm going to need some random properties of these functions to, to analyze them. So what I usually talk about is drawing functions from a k-wise independent family. Right, so H is my family of functions. I'm going to pick one function from this family of functions at random. And I want to say if it meets this k-wise independence condition, then it says that the probability over the random choice of hash function from the family that I see certain combination of values, that I see any particular combination. So any particular item hashes to one value and another item hashes to another value up to, the, up to k values. That should look 
uniform, right? So I'm basically going to use this in the analysis. Whenever we do analysis, we're going to basically rely on the fact we're only looking at small numbers, up to k numbers of items, and we're saying we can treat their behavior under these hash functions as essentially uniform. Um, this hash function does, is not linear, yeah. um, so I'm going to use this hash function to define this transformation, right? But I, I can, you know, I can do lots of non-linear things to define what particular entries of the matrix are, but because it's still a, a linear transformation, that's where the linearity comes from. Right? So I'll, I'll often sort of talk somewhat relaxedly about about these things, and we won't dwell too much on exactly. Uh, where we draw these functions from. We'll just say, make statements like, hey, H is KY's independent, and what we mean is H is a function drawn from a family of KY's independent hash functions. So all we need to know for today is that these things exist. They're actually not very difficult to construct. They have nice properties, um, but we'll just take them as a given. Okay. So let's, let's sort of just see, can we find some very basic data structure that meets this definition of a sketch, and we'll go on from there. So the most basic question I might ask is to say, suppose I see two streams, one stream defining a frequency distribution x, one stream, stream defining a frequency distribution y, and I want to just say, are these two streams identical or different? Right? Let me even make it simpler just for um, the first part. Let me even say that I'm going to promise that all the entries in these um, frequency vectors are either 1 or 0. And I just want to say, are these the same or different? So if you remember back to uh, Amit's introduction to information yesterday, hopefully he will at some point have given you the tools to understand that if you want to answer this question exactly, very good, very good indeed, um, then you basically need to remember everything. But if you can tolerate randomness, probability, then we can do better. Right. So in order to do, test this in small space, we're going to pick a suitable hash function. So you know, I'm using hash functions slightly differently here. Here I'm going to use a hash function that will have linear properties. Compute the hash of x, compute the hash of y, and argue, hopefully, there's a very small chance of giving the wrong answer very small chance for false positive and no chance for false negative. Okay. So the trickiness, especially compared to if you've seen hash functions used before, is we're now in a computational model where I don't see x altogether. I see it incrementally, perhaps not in the right index order. So I need to be able to compute these hash values incrementally. Right. So as I see new observations, I want to update my current evaluation of the hash function. So here's the hash function that I'll use. Um, my hash of this vector x is going to be the sum over all indices of the value at a particular index i times r to the power i, where r is going to be some randomly chosen number, modulo p for some prime p. And so r is now random in this range. OK. Why did I pick this one function out of all possible functions? Well, it has the properties that I want. Right? So again, it's a linear function of the input. So if I see a new bit, I'm told that at index i prime, there's a 1. I can fairly quickly work out what's the contribution. I basically just add on to my running sum modulo p of r to the power i prime. Now, how do I argue that it actually does the right thing that I want? Um, so you know, this, this modulo p is basically saying that I'm computing over a finite field. Um, and I can think about polynomials over that finite field. Right. So think of the polynomial that is basically replaced this chosen value r with just a variable alpha. And think of this polynomial that I get by taking the evaluation over vector x minus the evaluation over vector y. So I sort of pair up like terms, and I'm basically saying sum over all indices, um, xi minus yi times alpha 
to the power i. That's my polynomial. And my test is, is this polynomial zero when evaluated at a randomly chosen location or non-zero? Right? If it's non-zero, then I say I've got good evidence that x and y are different. If it is zero, then I, th I say I believe x and y are the same. So under what circumstances would I believe that x and y are the same when they're actually not? Right? So we've got non-zero terms somewhere in here, but somehow evaluating this polynomial at this particular location, I got a zero. So in other words, I found a root of the polynomial just by chance. In this case, actually by bad luck. I didn't want to find a root. So then I, I use the fact that this polynomial has bounded degree. It's got degree n, so there can't be that many roots. There can be at most n roots. So if I picked a random r, completely at random, without knowing what, these, what this polynomial would be, the chance of accidentally hitting a root is n degree of the polynomial divided by p, the size of the field. Right, so that's a application of Schwartz-Zippel lemma. It's one of the fundamental theorems of arithmetic. So if I can just pick p big enough, I can actually make this probability of inadvertently hitting a root of the polynomial very small. Right. So you know, the probability that, that I hash to the same value, given that my inputs are different, is n over p. Pick p to be polynomial in n, so just as large as possible. Question? Yeah, so, so here, basically here I'm sort of summing up to index n. So here I'm treating n as this size of the universe of possibilities. As n, n indices, right? So that's, right, just n is o summing over all possible indices. Yeah. So to get this probability low, to get it much smaller than 1, I can just pick p to be quite large. And the main observation is that it's not very costly in terms of resources to make p very large because I'm dealing in a you know, binary computer. So the number of bits I need to represent values in this field is basically logarithmic in p. Right? So even if, I'm, even if my n is very large, I'm dealing with indices that are maybe 64 bits in length. I can work over you know, 128 bit, 256 bit arithmetic, run this. Uh, hashing process and solve this equality inequality question. Okay, all right. So that's the first first tool, but you know that's not a very interesting problem, right? Just telling if two things are the same or different. Reasonably useful if you're downloading files over the internet. You want to know you've got the right file, um, but in terms of actually analysing what you've got, you want to do something slightly more complex. So the next thing I'll do is I'll talk through. Again, sort of staying at a fairly introductory level, how do we build up something to look at more complicated properties of um, the frequency distributions that we see? Okay. So we have our vector x. You know, we're going to mess around with notation quite a lot because uh, these slides came from many sources, and I kept switching notation. Um, so let f sub i be the the frequency associated with item i. Right. So equivalently, the ith value in this frequency vector. Looking at that distribution, there's lots of natural questions you might ask that will tell you things of, of some interest. Right. You might want to know which are the indices that have particularly large fi values. Those are the heavy hitters. I think later in the week, David Woodruff will spend about an hour just talking about that question. Um, you might want to find you know, how many of these fi's are non-zero. You've got a universe of possibilities, but maybe you only saw some fraction of them. How, what fraction did you see? Something that you know, is, is sort of mathematically foundational and turns, to be, turns out to also be the foundation of a lot of other questions is to compute what are called the frequency moments, so the sum um, over all these indices of fi to the power k. Again, you may well have seen that in lower bounds yesterday. And, OK, not so much. <laughs> and you know, other more complicated functions you can sort of conjure up. So things like some measure of the entropy. So treat this 
frequency distribution, rescale it to make it a probability distribution, and say what's the empirical entropy of that distribution. So just playing around with questions on these gets you access to quite a lot of, of different um, analyses. So this study, you know, historically, I realized uh, actually we're now about in the 20th year of really focusing on this question. I'm um, going back to this, this groundbreaking paper of Alon Matthias and Segedi, 1996, um, awarded the Girdle Prize about nine years later. This was the first paper that really formulated these questions, looked primarily at, at these questions, looked at saying, you know, for F0, the count distinct, F1, F2, F3, how can we compute these in limited space? And again, it was influential not just because it asked that particular question, because it set a template that many, many other papers have followed since in terms of how we might analyze these kind of questions. OK, so in order to, to answer these, we're going to need to build some tools. And again, just from first principles, I'm going to start to build these up so we have sort of an arsenal of tools to deploy. <laughs> and again, if you've not seen this before, it, it sort of requires a different mentality, a different sort of approach to these kind of questions, because we're going to think about randomized algorithms that give us answers to these problems. And each algorithm is going to give us an answer that you can think of as a random variable. Right? Each algorithm is going to output some random variable x, which is its estimate of the answer. And what we'd like to do is to say, you know, not just that this is this random variable, OK, great, here it is. We'd like to say this random variable is, is when we draw from it, when we run the algorithm to sample from this random variable, it's very tightly concentrated around the answer that we want to see. Right? So in order to do that, we need to use tools from concentration of measure to say, how does this random variable behave? Right, so a, random, a, a concentration bound usually looks of this form. Right, we've got our random variable capital X. We've got some value little x. And we're going to say that the probability that the difference between a draw of the random variable and some particular va value being large, so being far, is going to be quite small. Right? So to make use of this, we want to kind of instantiate all these. You know, what, sh what should this target value be? Usually that's the quantity that we're trying to estimate. How do we quantify this, this notion of being far away or not far away? And then we want to guarantee that this probability delta is, is sufficiently small and we can make as small as we like. Right. OK, so let's build a, a, a concentration inequality from first principles. We're going to build the Markov inequality. Um, so what do we do? We start with any probability distribution with one constraint that this random variable x that I'm going to analyze must only be non-negative. So it has zero probability of being negative. So here's my probability distribution. Right. And just pick some arbitrary constant k, hopefully somewhere you know, intersecting the tail of this distribution. And I'm going to think about what's the pro what's the, think about the event that my a draw from this random variable is more than k. Right. So let me think about sort of the indicator random variable. So take my take a draw from the random variable and look at the event that this is greater than k. So I'm going to write that as sort of the indicator of x being greater than or equal to k, and then multiply that by the value k. Right. So what does that get you? I have to do at least one chalk drawing today. OK. This gets you a new random variable, which is so zero in this range, right, off to infinity. OK, so I've created a new random variable that has this sort of square shape. And I'm making this, sort of, this statement that says, if I look at that random variable, it's less than or equal to x. So this is a slightly controversial statement, because I'm applying an inequality between two random variables. But what I really mean is sort of take a, take a sample from x and look at what impact it has 
here on the left and what impact it has here on the right, and I get, I get, in, I get this inequality behavior. Right. So what do I mean? It's just a case split. It says, well, either my sample is in the range 0 to k, so this event is 0, so I get a 0, which is less than or equal to the value I started with, or my sample is greater than or equal to k, so this side becomes k, but this is greater or equal to k. Right. Okay, so this is just sort of a, a chopping, a rounding of this random variable. Um, so I can now start speeding up. I can do, what can I do? Take expectations of both sides. So the expectation of this is just the probability that x is greater or equal to k times k outside. And this is just the expectation of x. And rearrange. Okay. So I rearrange that, and I've got the probability that a draw from x greater or equal to any constant k is less than or equal to expectation of x divided by k. Right. In other words, the probability that a random variable exceeds k times its expectation is less than 1 over k just by you know, substituting in particular values of k, renaming k. OK. So a lot of the time, this won't tell you very much. Right? In particular, if you pick a value of k less than the expectation of x, this tells you nothing. But if you pick a value, you know, 5 times, 10 times the expectation of x, it tells you that the probability that you see something 10 times the expectation of x is less than a tenth. Well, if you've ever met a statistical distribution before in your life, you'll know that distributions that meet that <laughs> are not very common, right? You're actually used to distributions that are much more concentrated, right? That their tail probability is much sharper. <laughs> but you've seen them from afar. OK, so this looks quite weak. Um, so what we'll do is we'll use this initially, get some initial results, and then show how we can essentially use this result to get something a bit stronger. OK. So we'll meet a sketch that uses Markov inequality to, to prove its main result. So our first sketches were, were just sort of keeping a single value based on hashing. Um, now we're going to keep a whole bunch of values um, derived from our input stream. Right. So again, we're back to this idea that the input data is some vector x of high dimension u. So again, I've just switched notation on you again. Now it's dimensionality u is the universe size. I'm going to map this large vector into a small array an array of counters, w counters wide, d counters deep. Right. How am I going to do that? I'm going to have d different hash functions, one for each row of this data structure. So the first hash function is going to map elements into the first row. The second hash function is going to map elements into the second row, and so on. OK. So here's our model of an update, our tuple that we saw earlier corresponding to an index j and, let's say, a positive update of, of adding quantity c on. We have our d different hash functions. The first hash function maps us to some location in the first row, and we just add on the contribution c to that counter. We map a second hash function into the second row, add on a contribution c in that row, third row, fourth row, and so on. So essentially, we're just you can think of this as just essentially doing a random bucketing of the, uh, the of, of the the matrix of the vector x is frequency vector x. You can think of it as essentially doing a, a, a random-ish permutation of the indices, and then just grouping chunks of indices together and taking their sum. Okay. So what do we get from this? Um, we'll think about what happens if I want to try to recover a particular index entry. So I got some particular j in mind, and I want to say, well, what was the frequency associated with that in the original vector? Well, I can just look in this reduced dimensionality structure and say, well, where did this entry map? So again, I'll sort of, it's the same process almost. If I'm looking for this particular j, j was mapped here. And so all of the frequency of j was mapped into this bucket. But it was polluted by other elements that also happen to map into the same bucket, because w is going to be much smaller than the dimensionality. 
Okay, but I can also look here and see how much was here. So I've got the same contribution of J plus other noise, J plus index, J frequency of index J plus other noise, and so on. So this, is, this gives you a nice inference problem. Right? Given that I've got many observations of the quantity that I want, each with noise that is hopefully somewhat independently drawn, what's my best estimate of that frequency? Well, I'm actually not going to pick the best estimate. I'm going to pick, in some sense, a very naive estimate. I'm going to say, rather than be too smart about this, I'll just say, I've got each of these independent estimates. If I assume, for the time being, that the total, all of the entries in the vector were non-negative, so all of the frequencies were, were greater or equal to zero, then I'll just look at each of these and say, well, which one of these is smallest? Because that corresponds to the smallest additive noise and I'll just take that as my estimate of the frequency of index j. Right. In other words, I'm estimating x at index j by just taking the minimum over the rows of the bucket that corresponds in the kth row and the, the kth hash of index j. Right. So wh uh, what do I get from this? Right. So here's my estimator. Um, just look at a single instance of this. I get what I want plus a random variable corresponding to the noise, right? the noise colliding with this index j. And if I, you know, I can get into the notation, but basically this random variable, I can think of it as just saying it's the sum over all indices times the event um, that there was a collision, that that index happened to map to the same location. Right, so this is a random variable. I can just take its expectation. I can say, what's the expectation of this? It's just you know, the sum over you know, those values times the probability of a collision, which, is, which I can sort of rewrite as just saying well, it's just the probability of any particular collision times the sum of all the mass, right? basically the one norm of the vector. Right. And that probability of collision you know, I'm just looking at this probability of two elements colliding in the same bucket. That goes back to my, my random hash functions that I chose to be sort of uniform enough. So if I just say that this is uniform up to a pair of elements, so it's pairwise uniform, then I can just assume that this is one over the number of buckets. I can choose the number of buckets, this parameter w, to make this quantity as small as I want. So I just rewrite that in terms of epsilon. Okay. So that's saying that on average, for any particular row, I don't have too much colliding mass. Right? So then I'll plug in the Markov inequality. It says, well, if on average I don't have too much mass, then it means half the time I'm not going to be worse than twice the average. Okay? Just directly applying that Markov inequality that we just built. So it says for any particular estimate, for any particular row, I've got a constant probability of not being too far away. I took the minimum. If the minimum violates this condition, then all d of those random variables violated this condition. I can treat each random variable for each row as being independent. So then the probability is, is this half to the power d, which gets small very quickly. Right? So I can just choose d to be some logarithmic in, in 1 over delta number of rows, and I can quickly push this probability of getting a large error down to some small delta. Right. So what do you get? You get an estimate that is biased, um, that says I'm going to get an estimate that is larger, greater or equal to the true value, and with probability 1 minus delta, so think of it as you know 99 point 9% probability, I only exceed the true value by some small epsilon fraction times the sum of the mass, basically the F1 in frequency moment notation. Okay. So that lets you find, if you give me an index, I'll estimate the frequency associated with that. Provided the frequency is moderately large, is more than some fraction of the total mass, I'll give you a reasonably good estimate of it. If it's small, then it just gets lost in the noise. 
So that goes back to one of the first questions we mentioned. It says, can we find all those elements that have a large mass, large contribution? The answer is yes. Yeah, so the easiest thing is to just say, let me enumerate all possibilities, query each one, and see which ones are estimated to be large. Right. Uh, I may need to play around with my delta just to make sure that I take that guarantee for a single estimate instead and make that a guarantee for all estimates. But that's kind of slow. Right? If I said my universe was sort of potentially unbounded, then it's going to be slow to find all those heavy elements. So you can start thinking about plugging this kind of sketch into a more complex data structure. Right? So the simplest thing you might do is think about some kind of um, notional binary tree over the input domain. Every node corresponds to a subset of the universe. And then you can have a sketch corresponding to each level of this tree. Right? So at the leaf level, you have exactly the sketch we've built before. The level above that, you've got a sketch where you combine deterministically. You know, one and two, element one and two go together, element three and four go together, and so on. The next level, you combine, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you can think of doing essentially a binary search, a search for binary tree, to descend this and saying, well, where do I find things that look heavy? Right. So what do I do? I sort of keep descending until I find a leaf that's heavy. And if I look at a branch and I'm, I estimate, and I think this, sub, this branch, this subtree, is small, is less than my threshold, then I believe that there can't be any heavy element within there, so I can stop that search of that branch. So hopefully that's, that's all fairly simple, but it starts to give a, a glimmer of results that people talk about in terms of compressed sensing, because you know, actually if you squint a bit, the compressed sensing problem is essentially you're given a, um, a huge high dimensional vector, you want to find these spikes, these heavy hitters in that high dimensional vector, and the access you're given to the vector is in terms of linear measurements, well, these sketches essentially give you linear measurements. So this is sort of a beginner's compressed sensing result. Okay, let me also mention briefly, very, very briefly, another application of this. Um, so in machine learning, very popular these days, often you're thinking of features that you might also represent as vectors, as high dimensional vectors. Um, so, you know, I might have a feature that corresponds to, did you visit this website and that website within a one hour period, right? So a huge number of features. And I want to build some kind of machine learning algorithm, train it on lots of data, but it's actually quite slow if I explicitly work with these features sort of fully rolled out. So there's this, this, this idea that's, that's come around that's quite effective called hash kernels that basically says, take exactly this idea of hashing a vector from high dimension to low dimension down to a much sort of lower dimensional space and then run the machine learning on this remapped low dimensional um, low dimensional representation. And I'm not going to say anything more about this except that it seems to work. And the machine learning people seem fairly happy with this. And and you know it's it's basically Underlying it is the same kind of reasons that you're getting a noisy representation of the features, but often the features that you want are stand out, have a reasonable amount of mass associated with them, um, so you can argue that you're not getting too much noise over repetitions of this hashing. Okay, so let's look at um, something a little more involved. Um, so we have our Markov inequality, it's quite weak. Um, so how do we get a better inequality? Well, we take the same inequality, but we apply it to a function of the random variable. So instead of just working directly with our target random variable x, we'll take some function of x. That itself is a random variable, so we can apply the Markov inequality to that function of the random variable, provided, of course, that we're dealing with something that still remains non-negative. Okay. So let's do, again, sort of the simplest thing I could think of here. Let's deal with, let's say, the square of, the, of a random variable. Well, in particular, let me take a new variable y, that's my previous random variable x, minus its expectation. So 
x minus its expectation typically would be positive and negative valued, but then I'll square it. Right, so now I'm back to a non-negative random variable. All right, so this random variable y, the probability that it seeds k times its expectation is at most 1 over k. And it just so happens, carefully chosen, that the expectation of x minus its expectation or squared is what we may more familiarly know as the variance. Right. So what this really says, if I then take the square root of, of what I get out of this, is that the probability that x deviates from its expectation in absolute terms by more than some factor times the standard deviation, more than basically a root k factor times the standard deviation, is at most 1 over k. Okay? So that gets us something known as the Chebyshev inequality. Uh, I think because Chebyshev was one of the people who didn't invent it. That's usually how these naming things work. Um, okay, so that's sort of its, its standard form that you know, we have this, or, or rewrite it, the probability that x deviates by more than k from its expectation is at most the variance divided by k squared. So here's, here's sort of a recipe. What we're going to try and do is cook up a random variable whose variance looks like a small fraction of the square of its expectation. Right? Because if we can do that, then we can actually say a statement like this, that the probability that x deviates from its expectation by more than a small fraction of its expectation is a constant. Okay, so we want to prove a statement like this so that we can conclude a statement like that. Okay, so here's the AMS sketch, the Alon, Matthias, and Segedi sketch, a variant of it. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of introduce it by being lazy by just taking the sketch I've already shown you and tweaking it to get something that gives their result. Right. So what's the tweak? The tweak is we need some extra hash functions. We need some hash functions, again, one for each row. So a function g1 for row 1, g2 for row 2 that maps from our universe just to plus 1 or minus 1. Right. So again, if we want to impress our friends, we'll call this, these things giving us uh, Radamacher variables, fancy name for plus 1s, minus 1s, with probability about a half, half. So the twist is, before we just took our update, added it on directly into the cell that we mapped into, now we add on the, the update multiplied either by plus 1 or minus 1, depending on what this hash function tells us to do. Right. So pretty much the same picture as before, although I'm going to change D and W here. So I map my element to a particular cell in a particular row, add on the contribution C, multiplied, let's say, by plus 1 here, minus 1 here, minus 1 here, plus 1 there, depending on what this um, hash function G tells us to do. And what we'll do is we'll look at, which, so we're trying to now estimate, I should have mentioned this more clearly, we're trying to estimate um, essentially the squared Euclidean norm of the input vector. Right? In other words, the sum of the squares of the frequencies. So what we'll do is we'll just take each row here as a vector and look at well, what's its squared Euclidean norm. So take the sum of the squares of each of these. And we get a few different answers, one for each row. So we'll take the median one. That's our algorithm. That's our estimator. Yeah. So when you dig into it, what do you actually get? Well, you, you sort of, when you start looking at what you get, you're squaring all the stuff in here. So within a bucket, you get something that looks like the quantity you want. Right? You get something that depends on the square of the contribution of each entry. But you also get lots of cross terms, right? You get cross terms that come about because when you have two elements colliding in the same bucket, you get a contribution that looks like the product of their values times the product of their hash values, um, these plus one, minus ones. OK. So you get a, a, a hash value squared, so either a plus one squared or a minus one squared associated with the term that you want. And conveniently, those all go to one. So you get. This contribution is exactly the thing you're trying to estimate. 
And then you say, well, you've got all these cross terms, but half the time they evaluate to one, half the time they evaluate to zero. So an expectation is zero, so we're done. OK. Can't quite fool you that quickly. So if I look at the expectation of this estimator, certainly it's correct in expectation. I get the quantity that I want, the sum of the squares of the entries. But then what I have to argue is that not only am I correct on average, but that the variance introduced by all this noise is not so large that doing some kind of averaging-like operation, or in this case, this median operation, will allow me to treat this as, as essentially small. OK. So my expectation is correct. Um, and I can look at what's the variance. So I've, I've now got a random variable that corresponds to the estimate that I get from each row. I can look at what's the variance of that. Um, I'll leave that to you because you do some algebra, and if you're not careful about it, you sort of get lots and lots of cross terms. Um, you have to keep track of quite a few of them. But actually, many of those terms drop out. Right? So you get terms of the form, you know, you're taking, taking this thing that's already squared, you're taking the expectation of its square. So you get sort of a degree four polynomial. But a lot of the terms like, look like, you know, this g function of a times a b, g of a c, g of a d. So if I take these degree four terms where each of these elements that I'm hashing are different, then I can again argue that in, even in, that in the variance these contribute zero, and that's fine. Right, so lots of stuff drops out of the variance, um, provided I now have a four-wise independence, because I'm looking at combinations of four variables. But again, I'm going to say that's easy. Right? Getting a, a four-wise independent hash function is fairly straightforward. Right. But I don't get rid of all the terms in the in variance. Right? I get you know, a term, any term that has an, any odd power of this hash function g goes away. Right? So any term that looks like this, right, I've got an odd power here, g of a, I've got an odd power here, g of a, g of b, g of a, g cubed. Those all go away. I get a few more terms and a bit more algebra, a bit more grinding. What I get is that the variance basically depends on the squared Euclidean norm squared divided by this parameter w that's the number of buckets. It's basically I get, I get a term in terms of these probabilities of collision that is just the probability that any pair collide. Okay. It's a fun exercise to go through and check this algebra. And that's actually really good. That says that the row variance I can bound in terms of the square of the expectation divided by this parameter w, so I can just stretch the size of this data structure, increase the width of this to drive this variance down. Right? So if I just choose w large enough that it looks something like 1 over epsilon squared, then it says a quarter of the time the probability that my row estimate minus the target value is more than so epsilon squared times the target value is a quarter. Right? So I've got constant probability of being only a small constant probability of being far from the quantity that I'm trying to estimate. So that says any single row, I get an estimate that with constant probability is good. But I want to go from just saying constant probability to saying high probability. Right? I want to make this very small. Okay. So just to introduce an element of tension and excitement, I think I'll move to the break now, and we'll answer that question after the break.